Oh, oh, there we go. All right. Uh, good evening, guys. Thank you for those who are here in person, and thank you for those joining me uh, via the internet in our Zoom world here. Um, before we get started, right, I got to do my usual intro stuff. So uh, my name is Mike Mary, right? I am the quote unquote town historian, right? I'm also a social studies teacher up at North Bergen High School. Uh, so I'd like to thank a couple of people before I get started as well. Uh, I'd like to thank my boss, Pat Brady, who gives me time to do my research while I'm at work. Uh, and then the students of North Bergen High School who went through a dry run of this earlier today. And Cy Rao, director of the library here. And Mayor De La Sago and the commissioners uh, for, you know, standing behind me and, and helping me out do all this preservation work. Um, so we are here tonight to talk about uh, the lost landmarks of North Bergen. And everything we're going to look at here tonight has been gone for almost 100 years. So we're going to see things. We're going to think we know where they are. And I unfortunately have to tell you, uh, no, you don't. Uh, because today, the world we know is very, very different from about 100 years ago. Uh, I tried to make this as colorful as possible, obviously, because we're looking at documents or, excuse me, images from 100 years ago. So a lot of black and whites. And I tried to mix in some color as much as I could here. So without further banter, right, let's just jump into this. So we'll start here. This is kind of a famous image, right? This makes its rounds online all the time. Uh, and this is of the Asmus estate, okay? Uh, this is a 17-room mansion, okay, fitted with all the modern amenities of an 1870 home, including gas lighting uh, and indoor plumbing, right? So this was quite the amazing structure. Uh, it sat on 16 acres of property. Uh, and again, it was owned by uh, Ernest Asmus, a German immigrant, who was a florist. So the 16 acres were covered with greenhouses. Now you're probably wondering, where is a 17-room mansion, right, 16 acres, where is something like this sitting, right? So it tells us it's on Hudson Boulevard, okay, which today we better know as Kennedy Boulevard. Uh, today, if I was to plot this on an address, this is 1901 Kennedy Boulevard. The building stood from 1870 until 1939 when it was demolished uh, to put in some housing for returning war veterans, right? So it was pretty interesting to see this. Um, the Aspens family was very active in the community here. Uh, Ernest Aspens' two sons, uh, one goes on to become the bacteriologist for the county. Uh, that was the predecessor for the health inspector. Uh, and then his other son, uh, Adolf, becomes mayor of North Bergen for one term, uh, from 1912 to 1916. So the family was very, very active and very well known. Uh, I also like this picture because it shows a trafficless uh, Kennedy Boulevard, which nobody's seen in 100 years. Um, the next one is another pretty famous haunt uh, of the old North Bergen era. Uh, this is the old Dietz Hotel. So the Dietz Hotel was located on 22nd Street and Kennedy Boulevard. Uh, today, uh, there's a couple of little stores and like a parking lot. It's across the street from uh, the Union City Preschool building that's down there. So the Dietz Hotel is owned by a gentleman by the name of Conrad Dietz, very major player in the kind of town, right? Owns several other businesses. And the thing that's really interesting about this hotel is it's the only hotel on Kennedy Boulevard, or Hudson Boulevard, as they called it then, south of 32nd Street. So if you were traveling through North Bergen and you had to make your way all the way up, you know, that was your only option to stay there, right? Um, gets demolished in the early 20s. And the only legacy the hotel has is the dead end street behind it. It's actually named Pete's Place. Uh, so they named the street for them. Family, excuse me. Now, transportation was key in North Bergen. Okay, there are about four major train stops in town uh, around the turn of the century. This first one here, as you can see, kind of above the uh, the doorway there, uh, is New Dorham. This is the New Dorham station. This is where the light rail station is today on 51st Street. 
So you had this kind of small depot, right? And we're talking on the west side of Tunnel Avenue, right? Where the parking lot and all that stuff is, right? So you know where the rails are. So you had this small station again, you could have bought your tickets here to go pretty much anywhere you wanted. Uh, it wasn't a localized system, but, <clears throat> excuse me, you could have got your tickets there, right? Send goods out of there, and it was a couple more places. There's the other side of the station. Then you had the Homestead Station, which was kind of a more popular location. This would have been about 34th Street today. Um, this is kind of a bigger interchange for people. So same kind of idea, right? You would have been able to buy your tickets, send goods, and we know it's a way more popular stop because of the advertising that's on the building, right? That this would have been more popular for North Bergen residents to use, Union City residents, West New York residents, and so on. Now, this is a really cool one, right? Because this one was a privatized train station. Sorry, would you mind speaking a little louder? They're having some trouble hearing you on oh, the I'm thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry for the people here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the Babbitt station, right? The Babbitt station is a privatized train station. It's actually built by B.T. Babbitt, who owned a soap factory. Uh, no longer there, right? But it was basically out in the meadows off of West Side Avenue. Uh, this is how he got his employees to and from work every day. Uh, and his employees came from everywhere. They came from North Bergen. They came from Jersey City. They came from Hoboken. Uh, the BT Babbitt soap factory was a massive, massive structure uh, that stood in the back end of town. And then there's this kind of like forgotten part of North Bergen where this is. Now, I know it's a, the Fairview. Uh, it's the Fairview station. Uh, this station would have been located on present day 95th Street and Railroad Avenue, which is in that Bergen Next section of North Bergen. It's kind of the, you gotta go through Fairview to get to it. Um, it's a really weird part of North Bergen. Like, you know, even, most people don't even know it's there. Um, but it's back where Boca Mino Park is. Um, and if you need like car parts, that's where all the junkyards are. Um, but back in the day, this was kind of a small little enclave of people back there um, that kind of lived like this. I don't want to say wild lifestyle, but there was a lot of bars back there, like a lot uh, of bars and hotels. Now, I went over this one today with the students in the high school, and, and they were all like very angry that like there's no theme park in North Bergen anymore. And I told them I didn't have an answer for them, uh, and then they were still mad at me. Um, like I was there, but this is uh, Columbia Park. Now the name should stand out because. Columbia Park is where ShopRite is, where Old Navy is, uh, and the name continues. So it is originally a 50-acre amusement park. Uh, it is owned and operated by Otto Osherback, right? A uh, kind of entrepreneur from Hoboken. Now, park opens in 1919 and operates until about 1942, 1943. It has everything you need as this private entrance for automobiles, right? And again, this is all located on Kennedy Boulevard, much like Columbia Park is today. Once you got inside the park, though, that's where things get really, really interesting. So inside the park, they had live entertainment on bandstands, on stages. Uh, they also had the most modern kind of amusement, you know, uh, activities, I guess we would call them, or, or rides. Uh, the biggest one is going to be the uh, the Giant Dipper, which is this roller coaster in the back. Uh, it's the largest roller coaster on the eastern seaboard at this time. Um, there's actually a description here of what the creator, or Arthur Luth, wanted it to call, to feel like, excuse me. He said he wanted people on the, on the ride to feel like they were being plunged down a mine shaft while being on a balloon ascent while parachute jumping, while on an airplane, through a cyclone, on a toboggan ride, and on a ship in a storm. So Arthur Luth just wanted this to be the, uh, apparently the worst experience in the history of the world. But it is a huge draw. Uh, there's also a sister roller coaster to this that is still in existence in California uh, on Santa Monica Pier. It's actually the same design, so if you're ever out there, Take a ride and you'll know what it's like being on a 1919 roller coaster in North Bergen. Here is a better picture, right? You have two roller coasters. You have the Big Dipper in the back, and then you have the Greyhound, which was a little smaller roller coaster, right? And it had a lot more speed to it. 
Uh, there's also this, the Dodger, which I think is a hysterical ride. Uh, today, we would call that ride more something like bumper cars, right? And, you know, the objective of bumper cars is to terrorize everybody else and, and give them whiplash, right? Dodgem is established because no one really knows how to drive in the early 20s. So this was a driving tool where you had to swerve and move uh, away from everybody, right? So it's an interesting kind of evolution of uh, amusements from learning how to drive uh, to smashing into each other, right? Which might explain why car insurance is so high now. Um, again, inside Columbia Park, it's 50 acres. It's huge. It's massive. And they have everything a, a person looking for a good time could have. Dance pavilions are going to be inside. Restaurants, bowling alleys, gardens. There's even a zoo located in the park. So they have a little bit of everything for everybody. Inside, there's boardwalks, very similar to kind of like Seaside would have today, or you know, even Six Flags would have down in Jackson. Um, the castle, right, is something that predates the township of North Irving. Okay, so the story goes that this structure on the inside, this castle, uh, is built in about, and from maps, we can tell it's built in 1840, okay? The castle is built by a man by the name of William Cantello. So the reason William Cantello comes here and, and builds a castle, right, he is this kind of British lord, right, owns a ton of property in England, falls in love with someone he's not supposed to. His family forbids the marriage. So William Cantello, in the middle of the night, gets as much money as he can, gets the girl of his dreams, and they take a ship to the United States. And they land in beautiful Hudson County, New Jersey. And he gets out and then has, uh, as the kids say, a weird flex, right? He has that entire building, brick by brick, shipped from England builds the castle, and they live there for at least another 20 years. Uh, the castle is then sold to another gentleman by the name of William Wright, and then by about 1870, uh, the Platz Deutsch group is going to come in and buy the property, and then, you know, the rest is history, as they say, right? It goes from home to home to community center to restaurant for entertainment purposes, right? So it's a really interesting history. Unfortunately, we lose it. Uh, in about the mid 40s when they get rid of the park. Uh, there was no preservation activity then. Uh, inside, again, the park, really weird rides and events, right? Uh, this is basically a 1920s petting zoo that used to be in town. Uh, they call it Noah's Ark, but you walk into this thing and they'd have all different animals, uh, animals from the state of New Jersey. Uh, we had seen advertisements that there were monkeys kept here. Uh, that there was once even a llama, right, which was like a huge thing. There's like month-long advertisements for this am of this llama that's coming in. Um, really interesting is this uh, object in the front. It is a mechanical hippopotamus. Uh, so as you walk up the gangway here, uh, it would lift its head out of the water. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And again, really interesting to see something this elaborate uh, that long ago. So you had that. Then really, the, this was the winner for this park. A 1.5 million gallon swimming pool that could hold 6,000 people at a time. Uh, now, where do you get 1.5 million gallons of water, right? That's a lot of water. They would pump the water from the Hudson River into the pool. It had the first modern filtration system in the world put in it. So they would have constant flowing water that was constantly being filtered out for whatever debris they fall in. Right, again, you get the great image of these, the bathing suits, right, of the 1920s, right, the, uh, the full coverings. Uh, but again, pool was there and very lively, uh, open from late May to late September every year. You then have kind of the remnants of Schutzen Park, right, and their festival hall. None of these are here anymore, unfortunately. We're just left with the Fritz Reuter building, uh, which most people know today as the, uh, the other retirement home now, and, you know, the, the Helix gaming location is down there. There were live sporting events held there every weekend. Football, soccer, basketball, 
boxing, right? Track races, shooting events. Um, there is a gentleman who actually spoke to who metal detected uh, the parking lot uh, behind Schutzen Park, uh, where the, the shop right is. And uh, he claims to have pulled out several bullets uh, from ranging what he said 1880 up until about 1930. Uh, and again, it makes sense, right? There was a big shooting kind of culture in this area. And I'll talk more about that with another amusement park. Inside Schutzen Park, you add the pavilion. And the pavilion, like I said, could have been anything at any time of the week. Monday, you could have a basketball tournament in here. Tuesday, roller skating. Saturday, dance party, right? So again, these places that we kind of lost the time, right, are kind of taken away, not in vain. Um, why this whole park, Schutzen Park, why Columbia Park kind of disappears uh, is because the state of New Jersey decided Route 3 and the Turnpike need to connect with the Lincoln Tunnel, right? So they cut right through town. Uh, and unfortunately, these were two victims uh, of that kind of progress that we made. Now, again, there is a lake that used to be on the location. Uh, the lake would be located where the housing is off to the side of, of Schutzen Park today. All right, moving a little further up, this is kind of like a weird one because it's like a lost landmark, but it's like still there in some ways. Uh, this is Grove Reform Church. It's the second oldest church congregation in North Bergen. Uh, it's founded in 1847. So this building, right, lasts from 1847 up until 1973 on the corner of 46th Street and Kennedy Boulevard, right? Today, we notice that white building that's there uh, but this building unfortunately burned down during a renovation attempt, and we lost the wooden structure. But the church we built, congregation is still there, going strong. We had the old people's home of North Bergen. Okay, now really grand building. It's in operation for about seventy-five years up until nineteen sixty when they take it down. Uh, this building now, if we put it on a map, would be where North Bergen High School is today. So they knocked this down along with several other homes that were there, including a B apiary um, to build a high school. But again, this was their typical retirement home uh, and again, served the community for all those years. This one's a little closer now. We have Hassan's Point, uh, which is where Crestview Medical is now uh, up on Kennedy Boulevard. Um, the Haas family comes to the United States in 1860. Uh, and it cost them in 1870 $20,000 to build that building. Um, yeah, it's an unheard of price for a house today, right? Especially new construction. Uh, but the house family are very big in town. And they lived in town for a very long time. Uh, and it was eventually turned into an old mobile dealership uh, up there on the corner. Uh, there was also the Waldorf Hotel. It opens the same year that the Waldorf Hotel in New York opens up with. And we believe that the reason they did that was to try to trick patrons into coming over here and using this Waldorf versus the actual Waldorf. Now, even though it's much smaller in scale, it has everything you could want in a hotel. Um, in the basement, there are bowling alleys. Uh, in the back, there are beer gardens. There is stables for your horses and carriages to stay overnight. And you are conveniently located next to an amusement park. Uh, that is something called the Racer. Uh, it is part of Little Coney Island, which is the second amusement park in town. And it is the first electric race car track in the United States, uh, which would have been right off of 9001 Burger Line or Kennedy Boulevard, right at the bend on Kennedy. So we'll jump around a little bit. This is going to be 75th Street and Broadway, right? The building on the right should look familiar because that building is still there, right? The homes on 75th Street are all still there. There's only one item that's not still there, and it's this building right here. This is the Woodcliffe Land Improvement Office slash trolley station. Now, the trolley station is built around 19, and it stood on the corner. And this was like a really interesting way to advertise the company. So if you wanted to buy property here, you'd have to take the trolley up to their station. Right now, the Woodcliffe Land Company and the North Hudson Trolley Company were all owned by the same people. 
right? So either way, they're making a couple of cents off you. Now, the really interesting thing is that we lose this landmark on the corner of 75th and Broadway. However, that building is still in existence today. Uh, this building was actually moved to 74th Street off of Boulevard East. So if you're ever on 74th Street coming off of Boulevard East, just walk up the street, it's on the right-hand side. The house is actually sideways. It's the only sideways house on the street. Uh, and that's the original structure, right? They had it moved. Uh, across the street, right, 75th and Broadway is a really major hub in the Woodcliffe section. There's a lot of stuff going on there, right? The train station, right? You have the, the restaurant, right? You have these beautiful apartments. Now, the apartments here on my left-hand side, they're still there. The apartments on the right, unfortunately, are no longer there. Uh, that's actually going to be known as the Haplin Block. Haplin Block is built by George Haplin. He builds one for himself, his wife, his kids. And then he realizes it's the only building on the street. So he buys the lot next to it and builds another one. And then buys the lot next to it and next to it and next to it and next to it. And at one point, Havlin owns almost the entire stretch between 75th and 76th Street. Now, we lose this 90% uh, of it. This part of the building is actually still there. So if you go over to 75th and Broadway, there's one section of the Havlin block left. Uh, and it is replaced by the Woodcliffe, or well, at the time it's replaced by the Woodcliffe Bank, which today we know as well as Fargo. Now, for schooling purposes, there are a ton of schools in North Burke. We've lost about six of them, okay? First school ever built in North Burke was the Granton School, which is built down around near the Six Corners neighborhood, right? It was an old one-room wooden schoolhouse. That was replaced about 1880. Second was Grant School, which was built inside of Hudson County Park. And then there was Franklin School and Cleveland School and Jefferson School, right? And even this building. This is PS number two. This is the original Robert Fulton building. So what is interesting about this is that, number one, Robert Fulton now sits on top of a hill. Uh, so they actually, when they demolished this building in 1925, right, they reconfigured the entire layout for the neighborhood. Uh, and then and this weird thing happens every time we go or they used to go and build a school, uh, they, they would run out of money midway through the projects. So Robert Fulton, right, being that it was in the Woodcliffe neighborhood, they really tried to make sure it happened. Uh, and that's why Robert Fulton is there. And if you ever talk to the kids in this town, the kids that go to Robert Fulton, they all have like this little bit of like chip on their shoulder, a little bit of swag that they have like the best school in town. And then I have to tell them I grew up at Lincoln School and they make fun of me and then I feel bad. All right, but that's neither here nor there. That's my therapist. All right, here's the old Jefferson School. Uh, this is now going to be where Kennedy School is down on 11th Street. Now, this structure is built in 1897. And because this area is growing so rapidly, they have to build an annex for the building in 1905 uh, to house all the kids. Now, these two structures are there until 1960. That's the only school for the downtown kids you go to. Um, replaced again by 1964 with Kennedy School. Then there's this one. And this is a really interesting picture because there's just a lot going on here. This is the old Washington School. This school was located between 45th and 46th Street on top of the Avenue, right? And if you look behind it, you can see this like massive like storage drum. That's PSE and G. Right, and at one point down at Six Corners, there were two drums to store gas and natural gas. Uh, both of these landmarks are clearly gone today, uh, replaced by one, replaced by a park, and the other replaced kind of by uh, apartment buildings. Now, again, when you go back into the Woodcliffe section, right, there is uh, a very nice church, or uh, I believe now it is a, uh, uh, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank, it's the old Temple Beth L uh, community hall. Uh, on 75th and Hudson Avenue. This is the original structure, right? It's an old reformed church. Um, and some of the one of the coolest facts is this that when they built the church, they didn't have enough money for like material inside the building. And that there was a family that lived up the street that would wheel their piano every Sunday down the hill. They carry it into the building, do what they had to do, and then wheel it back home so they could have entertainment during the week. Uh, now this building stayed, and again, this is a really cool image because it shows how developed the neighborhood is, and pretty much everything in this picture, with the exception of this building right here in the forefront, 
is still there now, right? You can see the apartment buildings overlooking Hudson County Park off into the upper right hand corner. You know, and again, these beautiful homes that line that section of town. This is the old, what well, says here, the old manor or the old mansion. Uh, this building is built in about 1850. All right, it's built by a gentleman by the name of Hamilton Meeks. Now, the Meeks family owns basically all of North Bergen. Um, if you look over, his son's name is actually on that document right there. Um, so the Meeks family are very wealthy, uh, and they are, they own everything. They are the founders of the Woodcliffe Land Improvement Company, and they make a killing selling the property here in North Bergen. Now, the Meeks lived there for a very long time. Eventually, they sell the property. This landmark was like the location for people to go to. Uh, it would have been located just right over Woodcliffe Avenue by the park. And when, unfaithfully, um, the building burns down in 1908, uh, and the loss actually rocks the town so much because that kind of shows the shift from the old North Bergen to the new North Bergen, that this Meeks mansion is now gone, the Meeks family is long gone, and, and the remnants of the old days, you know, are no longer with us. Speaking of old days, right, you have the McCollum Homestead. This is down present day 32nd Street and Liberty Ave, right, kind of where you get off 495 and, and you know, all that stuff over there by Best Buy. The McCollum family runs this hotel there pretty successfully. Um, Mr. McCollum actually has a very close relationship with a huge name in American history, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, right, the railroad magnate. Uh, was known to like just come to North Bergen and hang out here and just like watch the railroad develop and to like see what was going on and made major investments into the Susquehanna trails, uh, the train lines, and did it all from this like kind of random place like in North Bergen. So it's pretty cool to see. Uh, also on our website, if you take a look and blow that picture up, this is an old A&P delivery truck, uh, which is really weird to see. Um, you know, this is, you know, AMP, everybody knows AMP. All right. The post office in New York. This is the first post office in North Bergen. Okay. It is run by the Kittle family. Okay. This is Abraham Kittle here. And this is his wife, Sarah Kittle over here. Now they live off the side of the building and they were in charge of all the mail going to present day North Bergen. Since they had such a huge responsibility, Mrs. Kittle actually creates the return receipt, right? So that return receipt you get from the post office today, that's invented here in North Bergen because Miss Kittle was tired of people coming in not knowing where their mail was. So she writes up the first couple of receipts and the post office is like, this is genius. Uh, unfortunately, this was lost uh, when they created the new post office on 46th Street and Tunnel Avenue. Uh, this would have been right across the street from it. So great uh, new building, unfortunately, it replaces a great old building. Now, Little Coney Island, another major landmark. And when we're talking landmarks, we're talking like everybody knew Little Coney Island, right? This is where Bergen Line and Kennedy Boulevard meet, going into Hudson County Park. So if you're by like White Castle, this is across the street. Now, the park kind of had like a shady, kind of shadiness to it. All the rides that were brought to Little Coney Island were rides that failed inspection at actual Coney Island. <laughs> so the owners of this park were like, it's good enough. Um, now the park drew on average 10 to 20,000 people per weekend. Now, I mean, Hudson County Park gets pretty slammed in the summertime now, but I couldn't imagine 20,000 people uh, shoved into one intersection. But it had what you needed. It had rides, right? And this ride, I, this one always gets a laugh. It was called the Tickler. I don't know. <laughs> but that's the ride. It had casinos. It had bars. It had hotels. It had a Ferris wheel. It had a brand new handmade carousel by Frederick Dole. And Dole is kind of like the Michael Jordan of carousel making, right? But you didn't know there was a Michael Jordan of carousel making. But it's Frederick Dole. Um, and he builds tons of carousels right here in North Bergen. But bigger than Frederick Dole is this really unknown dude, a uh, guy by the name of Abraham Dormer. 
Now, Abraham Dormer is a Syrian immigrant to the United States. And he's kind of like a door-to-door -door salesman. He's just not very good at what he does. Uh, and he goes over to the St. Louis uh, World's Fair in 1904. And I tell this story often, but I feel like we got to tell this one so we get some credit here. Abe Dormer is standing in between two stands. He's got a stand where a guy is, a guy is selling ice cream, and he's got another guy on this side that's selling waffles. The guy selling the ice cream runs out of paper plates. Abe Dormer standing is like, ice cream, waffle, ice cream, waffle, give me a waffle, give me some ice cream, puts it on there, and the waffle cone is born. He comes back to North Bergen, he opens his stand in Little Coney Island in 1906 and creates the world's first waffle cone. And they're sold here for four years uh, before Little Coney Island is shut down. So next time you get a waffle cone, you can tell people, I know who invented that. This is the other angle from the park. This is much later on when the park kind of died down a little bit. Um, this is now today over here. That is the Nungesser's Hotel. Uh, that is where the Noches de Colombia is located on the corner there. Really interesting story about the Nungesser Hotel. It's founded by Henry Nungesser in about the same time, 1870. Uh, a lot of these other businesses are formed. Now, Mr. Nungesser, really like making money, like most business owners do. North Bergen said in the 1880s, you cannot serve alcohol on Sundays in the town. So Mr. Nungesser says, well, I own this property here. Fairview is right across the property line. He buys the property in Fairview and extends the hotel. And in a very cartoonish fashion, paints a line down the building. So on Sunday, he said, if you had a drink in North Bergen and the police came in, go across the line. And you were totally in the clear to keep having a good time. Um, the Little Pony Island area, the Nungesser's area, was a very lively place, right? And there was a lot of stuff going on there until one part of North Bergen said no more and threatened to break the town apart in 1910. Um, so there was a bit of craziness but we won't go into that it's for another time. Um, another lost landmark here is William Lusenjal, um, his florist. Um, florism, florism, florists dotted the landscape here. Tons of them were all over the place. Back in, when we look at old maps from 1900, 1910, there's greenhouses everywhere in this town. When we look at some of the records on these guys, they are supplying the floral district with flowers over in Manhattan more than anywhere else in the world. So one thing I often tell people is if you ever gardened in North Bergen, you, you will notice that you grow a lot, especially when it comes to vegetables. There's just something with the dirt here. And it's something people have known for a very long time in this area. Uh, so if you, got a, if you need a hobby this summer, plant some stuff in the yard, all right? Um, also up in that area, up right close to where we are now, was Hendel's Pine Lawn. Um, this is owned by Frederick Heindel. And, and you could kind of see it loosely in the back here. There's these kind of cages that are back there. They would charge people money to go walk around and like walk through pine trees. And that was entertainment in 1905, right? Very, uh, very far into today's world for entertainment. Um, but you could go up, his home was located on Heindel Place which is up, uh, right off of Cliff Avenue, north of the park in the Hudson Heights section. There's also the Riverview Hotel. It was a major, major landmark uh, on the corner of Palisade Avenue and Wycliffe Ave. Uh, today, there's a gas station there and the Rancho Mateo that's up there. That is the location where this was, right? You could have went in, dinner, you could have stayed overnight if you chose. And again, it gets taken down about 1940 you know, as some development starts going on in the area. Now, these places are all gone, which is very sad. We'll never get to see them. But there are some landmarks that survived, right? And you can go take a look and visit them anytime you want. Uh, this one, very, very old, right? The First Baptist Church is located down on 45th Street and Tunnelly Avenue. Now, it's not the original building, the original place but they kept it to be the same exact structure, right? They recycled a lot of the material to rebuild it. It predates the town, the congregation. The town was made in 1843, 
the congregation is founded in 1837, right? So they've been down there for a very, very long time. You can also go walk by this. This is still on Kennedy Boulevard, right? It's got a bit of creepiness to it, right? Don't go at night, all right? A little weird if you go at night, but if you go during the day, it makes sense. So this is the old Becker's Castle property. It's owned by Lewis Becker. And again, German immigrant, he's a florist, right? But he's also a real estate kind of genius. He buys everything that will become Union City. He buys it in about 1840. It's kind of worthless. Nothing's there. He then holds a blind raffle for investors in New York, right? So basically bingo, right? Think bingo. Bingo balls are going around. Who has property I-25? Congratulations, you're to I-25. Oh, gee, this, whatever. Investors buy the stuff sight unseen. They could come over here and they have a beautiful piece of land. Or they could be in a swamp. They didn't know. Becker didn't care. Because at the end of the auction, he said, you owe me $2.50 a month. Plus interest. No returns. Right? And he made a fortune. He made so much that he actually built this castle in 1860. The building is still there. It looks a little different today and has a way different function today. This is the New Jersey crematorium, right? So from 1860, 1870, up until 1907, the Becker family calls this place home. Now, as creepy as this sounds, if you ever get a chance to go in there, right? Most of the interior is exactly how the Becker family left it. All the original wood grain around the doorways, the stained glass that is in the old dining room, everything is still there. So when you go, you can take a look. Obviously, they refaced it and everything, um, but it is still a landmark that is there. Then, obviously, the most like iconic landmark in town, right? Been on the corner uh, on Kennedy Boulevard there since 1907, right? It's a very, very old building. Uh, and at one point, it was really small, very, very small building. It's not until 1926 that they are going to kind of expand it to what we know today. So again, another very unique image because there's no traffic on Kennedy Boulevard, right? Uh, and there's parking. Look, look at the parking. Um, but again, Town Hall has been there. It has seen countless mayors, right? Depending on who you're asking, Right? Some people will start in 1930 and they'll say it's seen 20 mayors so far. Right? Other people will start in 1907 and say it's seen about 50 mayors so far. Right? It depends on who you ask. But the structure there, right? Here's a later picture. This is after 1926 uh, because the expansion has been put onto the building. Now, building has an interesting history, right? Because uh, at one point, Everything was different, right? You used to have all the auditoriums, the police department was in the front, the fire department was in the front, the board of education was upstairs, there was an auditorium, there was a court, there was all this crazy thing that's going on there. Um, and again, it's been the seat of kind of all the activity in town since 1907. Uh, there's also this location, which is a weird segue. Uh, this is the caretaker's cottage uh, at Flower Hill Cemetery. Right, so it's the original English Queen, uh, Queen Anne style cottage. Right now it's just an office, right? But it's a major landmark for most people since about 1854, that building dates to. And then we have back over in Woodcliffe, right? This is now the Brazilian Rodizio restaurant over there on 75th and Broadway, right? We lose some of the spirals up top, but the building remains the same. You go over to the old Woodcliffe Engine Company, 75th and Broadway, or excuse me, Hudson, right? Again, building really hasn't changed much. Now it's just part of the North Hudson Regional Fire Department. The Trust Company, right? Like I said, it replaces the Hackman Block, which you can see right next to it still. Uh, originally founded to kind of separate Woodcliffe from the rest of North Bergen, but ultimately doesn't really work out that way. And now today, uh, it's presently Wells Fargo. He's gone through about a dozen changes since. Then one landmark that's really hard to change, right? The Palisades are extremely difficult to manipulate. Can't really move those around too much. But what most people don't know is that the Palisades are just a series of bridges 
right, that connect everything. Most people think it's just flat all the way across. But if you ever down a river road, look up and you'll see all these kind of insane arches that are done all along Boulevard East. There you get another great view here. Boulevard East, right? Still a major landmark, right? Go there any Saturday and it's jam packed with people, right? It always has been. One thing that's really cool I like about this one is if you notice up here, it's a giant wood sign that says Woodcliffe, very similar to the Hollywood sign. Uh, it's how the Woodcliffe company advertised to New Yorkers to come on over. Look how much room we have here. Um, and again, unfortunately, uh, the home is no longer there, but we still got Boulevard East. And that wall is the original wall uh, when you go there. Then here, again, this is probably one of the most picturesque streets in North Bergen, right? This is 75th Street off of Boulevard East, the, the Red Brick Road. Uh, this is when the homes were just built in 1919. Uh, the street really hasn't changed much uh, in the last hundred years. You know, the trees obviously grew a little bit, but other than that, everything is almost identical. We have the home here up on 78th uh, and Broadway, okay? Uh, that Victoria Mansion was built in 1893. Uh, and again, kind of a major landmark. Most people from that neighborhood will recognize it. And the really cool thing is, most people will know a family. You can tell when they lived in that neighborhood by what family they reference living in the house. Here we have right here, not very far from here, right? 78th Street going into Hudson County Park, right? The apartment building there is the first modern apartment building built in North Bergen. Uh, and it's built by a Gaetano uh, Mango, an Italian immigrant builder who came over and built that structure. Uh, first here with that great gargoyle hanging off the corner. So it's really cool detail. The park itself too has not changed much um, over the last hundred years. Opens in 1918. The really interesting thing is all the county parks in Hudson County are all built by the same guy all within five years, right? So if you ever get a chance to look at say North Hudson County Park and then go out to Kearney, West Hudson County Park or Lincoln Park, you'll see there's details that are all identical in every park. Um, again, made by Charles Lowry, right? We have the old tea station there, right? These beautiful curves and everything. Today, you could go to any of these locations, take a look, right? The old rest house, where this postcard is from, we actually find the image that it's based off of, uh, which is really rare to see. Uh, this was being your by uh, William Restell, uh, as he kind of traveled through North Bergen, he's not from North Bergen, he just happened to be here and took a ton of pictures. Uh, but again, those are some of the landmarks that are left. And that is all I got for you guys tonight. If you have any questions, I'll gladly take them. If not, okay, bye. You mentioned Woodcliffe a lot. Is that the name of the of North Burgundy Corps? No. So, okay, Woodcliffe is a neighborhood in North Burgundy. And as much as it hurts me to admit this, as somebody who grew up on 67th Street, Woodcliffe is the nicest part of North Bergen, right? I'm going to get yelled at by people now that they're the part of, okay, I get it. All right. All right. I can admit it, though. All right. Woodcliffe is going to be everything from Burger Line Avenue to Boulevard East, from the park to the Dunbar town line, right? So that was a whole section of town. And in 1909, 1910, they did not want to be part of North Bergen anymore. They wanted to leave. They got caught up in boroughitis, which was, you know, if you ever look at Bergen County, there's like 7,000 towns, right? They all wanted to have, you know, home rule and be in charge of their own affairs. So the folks in Woodcliffe actually tried to break away. Uh, the only reason it fails is because the state senator that sponsored the bill had to admit in Trenton in front of hundreds of people, he didn't read the bill and he didn't know what it was about. And that's the only reason Woodcliffe remains part of North Bergen. Um, but yeah, I, I reference Woodcliffe a lot because, and, and you know, this is up for debate, but Woodcliffe was, there was a lot of wealth in Woodcliffe, which is why most of the images we have are of that neighborhood. And that was the story you said that was for another time. That's, yeah, that's a whole story for theirs. There, it gets ugly when Woodcliffe tries to leave. There's fights, there's, there's insults being thrown around by people, and yeah, it gets really crazy 
uh, to the part where the, the town literally almost tore itself apart, right? So it was a very intense moment, um, especially because when you look at the history of North Bergen, everybody leaves us in a sense. So when North Bergen was created in 1843, we are Jersey City Heights, Union City, Hoboken, West New York, Gutenberg, Sea Caucus, right? Even parts of Fairview are considered North Bergen. And all of those towns slowly leave and chip away and leave and leave and leave and leave. leave. Sea Caucus being the last one in 1900. Uh, so when these guys wanted to leave 10 years later, it was like almost like kind of like personal. Yeah, they were like, oh, like, wait, you're, you're clearly part of our town. Like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah, it got kind of contentious real fast. Uh, and then the people of Whitcliffe tried to do it like 10 years later again, uh, but that one didn't really get too much momentum. And Gutenberg before the war. Yeah, Gutenberg, which, you know, I tease the kids in the high school that are from Gutenberg. I'm like, I'm going to talk about Gutenberg. Um, <laughs> the state of mind. Uh, not a good place. No, come on, man. Uh, but Gutenberg is actually the first planned town in New Jersey. Right, so if you ever look at Gutenberg, right, I know it's easy to because it's so small, right, but all the streets are straight lines, every single one of them, right, the only curved road in that town is Boulevard East, and that's because the natural geography of the street, but every other part of that town was completely planned out, right, the grid system, where the amenities are laid out, right, by, by amenities, I mean, post office, police department, fire departments, perfectly planned out. Um, and Gutenberg actually, you know, it's an interesting because we don't know where the name comes from, right? There's two thoughts of where Gutenberg comes from. Uh, number one, it's in reference to John Gutenberg, right? The guy who has printing press, because the people who immigrated there were from the same town that he was from. So they said they named it after him. However, if you break down Gutenberg and you take it back to German, Guten means good. Berg means mountain, Gutenberg sits on top of the Palisades. So were they talking about the inventor or were they talking about the location, right? The good mountain. Um, my favorite weird trivia fact about Gutenberg also is that there was one bar on every street in Gutenberg at one point, uh, which gave it this weird reputation. Um, and a weird rumor, which unfortunately is not true, because I, this would be a great story is that Gutenberg was created because North Bergen banned alcohol. <laughs> and that North they were like, no, no, we're not doing that. Uh, but no, in reality, it's just a completely planned out town. But yeah. There's a couple of questions in the chat. I'll okay. read them out loud. Um, there's quite a few. So please forgive me if I don't get to everyone's question. Um, first, can you clear up the boundaries of Woodcliffe one more time? Okay, Woodcliffe. Bergen line to Boulevard East. 78th Street to Gutenberg. That's Woodcliffe. Um, but when Woodcliffe wanted to leave, they actually wanted to take everything from the Hudson River to the Hackensack River from the line all the way up. They were very ambitious people in Woodcliffe. Um, they weren't fooling around. <laughs> um, next question is actually a question for me. If we have any YouTube videos that you did on Town Hall, we do not, however, Next week on Tuesday, we'll be having another one of these on Town Hall. Um, and it will again be a hybrid session for those of you who want to come in person um, or for those of you who want to attend online. Um, the next question, why did the Hudson County Police abandon the police station in the park? Okay, so they effectively abandoned it because their mobility became better, right? At the start of the park, you have to remember, like, you have cops on horseback, right? And you have cops later on, you know, on motorcycle. And you have to also factor in that the county police, what we, how we know the county police today is very, really weird compared to back then. Um, you had the county police that monitored the parks, but then you had the boulevard police that just patrolled the boulevard, right? Meaning Kennedy Boulevard and Boulevard East. You had local police departments. So what happens is in about 1935, they combine the county police and the boulevard police into one unit, right? So because they have more distance to cover, they give up the, the, the location at the rest house. Um, 
really the rest of the house, you know, it's not much going on there. It's basically just bathrooms. Even back then, it was bathrooms and their office for the officers to kind of hang out in. And if they needed to detain anybody, they would keep them there until North Bergen police came together. Uh, but ultimately, the county gives up on the, using it as a police location just because their technology gets better. Um, I've got a couple questions about some of the slides that you did, so we might need to backtrack. Okay. Um, on the North Bergen Town Hall slide, can you point out the mayor's corner office? Sure, of course, yeah. So when you're looking here, this is the mayor's corner office, right? Always has been, always will be. Uh, if you ever get a chance uh, to go in to like the mayor's office, beautiful wood grain on the wall, right? The design inside there, they haven't changed it uh, ever, right? So that look that's in there is the original 1907 look. Um, the desk that's in there as well, and we'll go more into detail about this next week, but that desk is the original mayor's desk from 1930, uh, which has like this crazy story relating to the depression, but I gotta get you guys to come back next week. So you'll have to come back next week to hear the rest of that story. Um, on the Braddock Park slide, um, there was art on the wall, something to do with a farmer's harvest. Do um, you said you just passed it. Um, sorry, Rashad. <laughs> he says stop. <laughs> this, one. this one? He says no. I'm sorry, Rashad. I don't know if we can track this one down. All right, I'm sorry, Rashad. We might need to we might just skip this question for later. Okay. Um, all right, the next one. Did you come across a landmark called the three pigeons in your research? Of course, the three pigeons. The unfortunate thing about the three pigeons is the sketches don't match, right? There's all different sketches of this location. The three pigeons location would have been down at six corners at the corner of Grand and uh 43rd Street. So the Three Pigeons Inn was a tavern, right, located down there, but it was unfortunately destroyed in 1889 uh, by William Meyer, who, you know, as a North Bergen guy, I'm not going to like him because he's from West New York, all right? It's just a general rule. You can't like people from West New York. <laughs> New York Bergen. Um, uh, but William Meyer, great architect. He actually designed a bunch of the public schools in West New York, uh, and he had this kind of grand plan for that section of North Bergen. It just never worked out for him. Uh, but in his attempt to make this kind of neighborhood down there, he eliminates the oldest kind of landmark the town probably ever had. Um, the inn goes back to pre-revolutionary war times. Uh, stories of George Washington stopping there, the Marquis de Lafayette was stopping there, you know, um, General Henry was stopping there, right? There's all these major American Revolutionary War figures that pass through there. Um, but again, in 1899, he's not probably thinking about that. He's probably thinking about building like a community and unfortunately we lost those. But we do have images of those on our website. Next question. Do you know where the Frenchman's gardens were located? Oh, of course I know where it is. I guess I should tell you now. Um, <laughs> so the garden, okay, is located today, very creepy. It, it's a cemetery. Um, so what the Frenchman's Garden is this? During the American Revolution, right, to stick with that theme here, okay, the Marquis de Lafayette, very young French officer, comes to the United States, kind of follows George Washington around, right, during the New Jersey campaign, and he fights at the Battle of Pulse Hook, right? He, so he sees Hudson County. As they show him, like, the rest of this area, they're like, look at how great this place is. So he's like, this place is pretty great. He then writes a letter during the war back to King Louis the 16th. He's like, hey, I found this place. Do you want some of it? And, you know, King Louis being a king was like, yeah, obviously, right? How much is it? He's like, it's practically free, right? So King Louis then creates this commission headed by Andre Michaud and Paul Sagnon. And they are then commissioned to come here, use this property, which is now Hoboken, Macfell, and uh, Flower Hill Cemeteries. And they're 
job is to basically cultivate plants to send back to France uh, for King Louis' palaces. So they create a couple of different plants there. Uh, one is a poplar tree, which if you go to France today, all the poplar trees that are in France originate from a tree in North Korea, which is really weird uh, to think about that. But again, they did that. And all of those locations from the Frenchman's garden, unfortunately, were wiped out uh, when the cemetery was taken over in the 1850s. Uh, there were some walls, there were some homes, but everything's gone. Like everything else, like the Big Dipper and, and like other things, there, there are sisters to a lot of these things. Uh, Andre Michaud has another Frenchman's garden uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, which is kind of what we think ours would have looked like as well. Um, so that's what we know about the Frenchman's garden. Awesome. Um, the next question is also another location question. What was the location of Schutzen Park? Okay, Schutzen Park is the same location it is right now, uh, down at 32nd Street and Kennedy Boulevard. Uh, so it would have actually been from that corner all the way to about 29th Street, right? Remember, we're talking 50 acres of property. Um, and if you go, if you ever look at a map of North Bergen, and you look at where McKinley School is, the property for Schutzen Park and Columbia Park, right, that whole location actually went all the way into the town. Uh, and there's stories of, in the newspaper, about the teachers in McKinley School having to go chase students down in the park during school days. Um, which now as a teacher, I'm like, I would probably just join the kids. Um, but <laughs> it's why they don't let me teach at McKinley School or my amusement parks, I guess. But um, yeah, the park was massive, but it's basically that same location where the mall is, where the shopping center is today, where Schutz and Parks property is and those apartments in that whole neighborhood surrounding it. Uh, the next question, I thought Bergen was a Norwegian name. How did it come to be? Okay, so Bergen is a Dutch word. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, and the story goes that when Henry Hudson and his men sailed into Weehawken, they, they yelled out Berg, right? And Berg meaning wall in Dutch. Uh, and then Bergen just kind of evolved into that, right? Because again, remember, Hudson County and Bergen County were at one time, not just one county, but one town, right? Which is really crazy to think about that much space with just one town. Um, and then we don't get real development until about the 1822. Uh, um, Revolutionary War comes, you get Hackensack, you get places like that, you get Jersey City, right? And then by 1840, everything splits, right? But Berg is going to come from those original Dutch guys that showed up here. And the next question is another question for me. What is our website? Our website is www.mbpl.org. If you go on the library's website, click on Adult and the menu options up at top, and then click North Bergen History. There'll be links. Um, I think we have a link to the Historical Society's blog yes. and your Facebook in there. That's true. So, uh, next question. Could you explain what was the purpose of the arcs in the Palisades Cliffs? Sure, it's just basic, uh, it's their construction me method, right? The archways are gonna get you more stability when you kind of cross those gaps. Um, they weren't used for anything other than just structure support, and perhaps even some decorative purposes. Um, next question. Sorry. I'm curious to know if the small towers on the east and west sides of the corner of 79th Street and Boulevard East ever had a function, or are they purely ornamental and decorative? Sure. Every time we go, we have that question. Um, ornamental, for all we know, right? Anything we do know, they were probably most likely just storage for the maintenance crews, but it's not like you had to pay a fee to get into the park. They were just kind of there as these kind of markers to let you know you're entering the park. And that's all they really served purpose for. Perfect. That is the end of the questions in the chat. I survived. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see everybody next Tuesday. Tuesday? Tuesday, yes. Oh, boy. All right, yeah, next Tuesday. I hope to see you guys all next Tuesday, all right? Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.